Amen. Ephesians 6, 14 through 17. So stand strong with the belt of truth tied around your waist and on your chest with a protection of right living. On your feet with the good news of peace to help you stand strong. And also use the shield of faith with which you can stop all the burning arrows that come from the evil one. Accept God's salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit. That sword is the teaching of God. Amen. You may be seated. I am excited to be before you today, to have an opportunity to share with you the sword of the spirit. And the reason I like that, because it's talking about combat, and I'm a guy of combat. I love it. I've um, been participating in it all my life, and I like to, first of all, before I even start, I got to give a big what up to my uh, lovely, beautiful wife over there, Kelly Short. <laughs> That's my, that's, that's my main motivation. That's who keeps me doing what I do, who helps me and supports me to do what I do. And I always like to let her know that I appreciate her and I love her. Thank you, baby. And she put up with me. <laughs> and thanks to my children over there as well, my, my posse of boys. Um, today we're going to talk about the sword of the spirit. My goal today is to help you um, understand or fully understand the what, the why, the when, and the how of the sword of the spirit, okay? When I was younger, I wouldn't even say younger, I was even older at the time, depends on your definition, but um, when I looked at the passage of the sword of the spirit and the book of Ephesians where it talks about um, our armor, the uh, armor and the weapons of warfare and all of that. And then they talk about the word of God and talk about how it's like the sword. Um, that used to throw me off a little because I couldn't piece it together for some reason. So today what I want to do is help you to piece it together and become even more um, skilled in combat than what you were when you came in today, okay? And I want to help you and myself to increase our faith in the Lord more so than we were before we came in today, okay? That's the goal today, and that's what we plan to accomplish. So the first part is the what that I explained to you. And the supreme weapon we have to successfully fight in this spiritual warfare is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So that's the what of our conversation today, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, the why, I trust that after these over, since these several weeks have passed, and those, that you, those of you who have heard the teachings that's been coming forth, and if you haven't, I encourage you to go back, um, go to our website and pull them up and listen to them. But it's been speaking about the whole armor of God, and I hope it's been firmly ingrained within our hearts and within our minds that we are truly at war. We are truly in a war, and a lot of us take it mildly, but you see, Satan isn't playing with gloves. He's coming with everything he has. We're in war, and it's not a physical war. It's a spiritual war that transitions into the physical, if you get what I'm saying. So I don't want you to think, I'm safe, it ain't, you know, I ain't a spiritual guy, so I don't have to worry about this war. And wrong. It's a spiritual war that the results manifest into the physical, okay? So that's why it's very important that you pay attention and that you hear from God concerning your life today, okay? So, let's move on. The bulk of the pieces that we've been talking about over the past few weeks and that we've examined are all defensive in nature and are all meant to protect us from the enemy's attack, okay? Those were the defensive weapons we've talked about in the past week, like the helmet um, last week. Oh, that was a good sermon, wasn't it, those that heard it? Oh, I'm still studying and, and basking in that. But... 
as an ex-boxer, I picked up a valuable lesson that helped me become to the next level. And that lesson is that a good offense comes from the foundation of an excellent defense. You see, when I learned that one principle, I went to a top-ranked level fighter. See, it's one thing to come in as a fighter. Yeah, anybody can say they're a boxer, but everybody can't say they're top-ranked. When you learn that principle, that causes you to go into another level. Now, when I say learn, learn meaning not have it only within you, but to also activate it, have it activated within your life, okay? So learning is just not knowing, but learning is also doing. Okay, performing, all right? So today what we're going to do is we're going to examine the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So let's take a look at the sword. We got a picture here, and the sword is symbolic of the word of God. It was a, a picture I sent in, but you know what? When I thought about the picture that we was going to show you, I said, and this was on yesterday, I said, you know what? I would love to have an actual Gladius, that's the name of the sword. The sword is called Gladius. And I would love to have the sword with me today to show, to actually show people what it looked like, you know, so they can actually see. And I was like, where in the world would I get one from? And I said, you know what? My good friend, if she don't have it, nobody will. Um, and Christine, I would like to say thank you <laughs> so much. She's a collector of swords, and she has some pretty pieces, as you will see with this one, the Gladius Sword. And the Gladius Sword that the scripture si speaks about is this in nature. It's double-edged, which means it's sharpened on both sides there, so you can cut from this way or you can cut from that way. Either way, you can cut someone from as well as pierce them, okay? So, and then it's the handle is finely tuned and balanced so that when you hold it, it's not a light, it's, it's not a light sword, but the way it's balanced causes it to make it feel that it is light. Just want everyone to see this sword. And this is the Gladius sword. It's about 12 to 20 inches long. And the reason that it's designed short is because, hey, short things are awesome. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, get on track, Jacques. The reason that it's a design, my last name is short in case you didn't know. Um, the reason that it's designed this way is because it's it's primarily used in short, in, um, look at me, close combat, short combat. It's primarily used in close combat, okay? So that's why it's designed this way. Now, the gladius is not the only weapon that the Roman soldiers had, but it is the weapon of choice, okay? The gladius is the weapon of choice. I don't want to put it there because it'll come in handy. All right, now let's talk about the word of God, okay? We saw, I've explained to you the gladius, which is the physical sword that the Bible speaks about, okay? Now let's talk about the word of God so we can understand that, okay, as a, in its description. The spirit of God has given us, Christ's followers, a marvelous weapon that lies within the word of God. That's not just this book, but the scriptures that lie within this book. And when we talk about the word of God, this is very important. Um, the apostle Paul who wrote this is not referring to the entire Bible when he says the word of God. Um, the word translated, word translated in the Greek does not derive from the word logos, but it derives from the word rhema. And you might say, well, what is rhema? Well, the word rhema basically is just a particular passage or scripture that is relevant to your particular need at hand. Okay? So, quick example. When you're reading the word of God and something speaks to you through the word of God, you're reading the Bible, something speaks to you and you have a need or something you're going through and you're like, wow. 
Oh, man, that's a revelation right there. That's the rhema word of God, okay, in description. So we need to understand this in order for you to piece this together, learning, teaching you how to be combat soldiers. When you leave here, Satan's hating me for this. Oh, my goodness. When you leave here, you don't worry about a lot of stuff. You know why? Because you got skills. You got skills to handle yourself. Okay, in the name of Jesus. So, whether used defensively or offensively, a single verse or passage which is well understood and rightly, and rightly applied can be an extremely powerful weapon that works on our behalf. It has to be well understood and rightly applied. Okay, now that's the word of God in description. And when you bring the word of God with the sword, you know, you can see how they match and how they fit together to help you more so understand why it speaks about the word of God being a sim symbol, symbolic to the sword, okay? Now, understanding when defense, uh, we're speaking about defense now, we're going to talk about the when, the when to use the sword. You can use it for defense, you can use it for offense, okay? But we're going to speak a minute about defensive usage of the sword, the word of God. Even though defense armor has been covered over the past few weeks, the word of God, which is the sword of God, is a defensive armor as well. Did you know that a relevant spoken scripture can challenge or even deflect a sharp temptation. A relevant spoken scripture can challenge or deflect a sharp temptation, and it can even block the thrust of false teaching or even ruminating thoughts that are in our mind. So what are you saying? When the enemy says, I'm placing an attack on whoever you are, he says, he tells his imps to go out, and this is what I want you to do. Place temptation on their mind. Cause them to walk out of the will of God and sin, okay? Speaking the word of God, or not even speaking, but in that last song that we did in worship, that's awesome. You don't even have to be able to just speak. But when it speaks about speaking the word of God, speaking also refers to singing the word of God, because sometimes you may not want to, you, it may not be in your spirit to recite a scripture, but I remember my grandma walking around the house all the time, and I don't remember her reciting scriptures by talking. I remember scripture reciting by singing. She would sing scriptures. It didn't, it wasn't a song that somebody had created. She would just have a scripture on her heart and just begin to sing it. So singing, if, if someone is deaf and they can't speak, they're mute, they can't speak, sign language is their way of communication. So that's speaking for them. It doesn't mean just because you can hear me audibly. No, hey, that rhymes, you kill. <laughs> but you can hear me through sign language or whatever the case may be. You understand what I'm saying? So that's speaking. And when you speak that, it stops the attack of the enemy in its place. It severs that attack. And he got to come at you another way or recalculate things and come at you. Okay? So that word going forth puts the enemy at bay. Because... At the name of the Lord, what happens? Every knee does what? Bow, and every tongue confess. So you must speak to use that. And a good example, let's, um, let me, a good example that will, of scripture being used to beat back temptation is found in the book of Matthew, the fourth chapter, the first through the 11th verse. Um, let's get that on the screen there. Got a little cotton thing going on. Mm. Better. My wife told me you were making funny movements with your mouth in the first service. <laughs> so I don't, don't want to be doing that this service. Better, babe. I'm on point now. All right. Okay. 
focus, Jacques. <laughs> then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Now, when we look at that, you see, Satan attacked Jesus in three areas that is common to his attack upon our lives today. Don't know if you realize it, but the same area that he attacked Jesus, areas he's attacked Jesus on the mount, he attacks us in those same three areas today. And those are the only areas that he knows to attack us in. So that makes it a little easier for us to prepare our battle because we know his game book. We know his plays. We know what he's going to do. We know how he's training. We know what he's taught. So that makes it a little easier for us if we use it adequately. So one thing, um, the three areas that he attacked Jesus in, and you say, well, what are those areas? Well, it was the lust of the eye that deals with the area of materialism. Then it's the lust of the flesh also known as lust of the body, and that deals with hedonism. And then there's the pride of life, and that deals in the area of egoism, okay? And then every time we notice that Satan tried to tempt Jesus in these ism areas, Jesus countered defensively, defensively using the word of God, okay, as his sword by throwing out of it is written statement, okay? Jesus bought... Je what Jesus did is he brought to the battle a specific passage of scripture that dealt with the specific nature of the temptation that was challenging him. You get it? Satan comes at him with a temptation. Jesus pulls out a specific scripture. I was at home coming out of the shower and the revelations you get in the shower is awesome. I was, and, and Jesus, the Spirit said to me, yeah, don't use, go to the fight prepared. If I come to fight in a war and I bring, this is my weapon. I don't know if you can see this, but this is my plastic knife, my sword. If I bring, this is my sword, how much damage am I, well, well, if our national defense system went out, would you rather them carry this as their weapon? Or would you rather them carry this as their weapon to protect you? Which would you rather have? So you might say, well, of course I would rather have the sword. You're not going to do much damage with the plastic, <laughs> with the plastic knife. But something I realized that Jesus was showing me through that illustration is that a lot of us today will grab this as our defense. What does this represent? Well, let's talk about this one first. The Bible tells us that this represents the word of God, double edge, both sides, smooth, <laughs> balanced, powerful. That's what the Bible tells us this represents. That's the word of God. What does this represent? Everything opposite to this. Whatever is said about this, smooth, powerful, balanced, this is the opposite. You will not get smooth. 
You would not be guaranteed balance. Read the package that it came in. You would not be, any of those guarantees would not be there, okay? And the problem is many of us leave and go out in our life using this as our sword. True, many of us are saved, and that's okay. We're still going to go to heaven. But what's the purpose of you teaching us about these swords and stuff? Well, it's to make your life a little more pleasant on earth. It's to make your life a little more victorious on earth. Why? Because you have challenges. You have the devil who still exists with all his little workers, these imps running around, and and he's coming after the salvation and the purpose of Christ within your heart. And he's coming to stop that. He's coming to stop from seeing you advance the kingdom of God forward. And what does he say? Well, I'm coming after them. And many of us will say, well, why is the devil always after me? Um, he's coming after me and I have so much trouble and it's so hard for me. Well, you know why the devil's coming after many of us? Because many of us has failed to say it is written. Many of us don't even know what is written. So those that fit that category, they're, they're, they're fighting with this. Is that okay? If that's the weapon you choose, it's okay. You know, whatever you, however you choose to take a whooping is okay. You know, that's what it boils down to. So when you know what is written, and you begin to profess and proclaim what is written, that's when you bring out the big boy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's when you bring out the big boy. So know what you have before you. Know what God has given you in order to advance yourself in the kingdom. My kids are well used to this um, teaching of using the sword, using the scripture. My wife is a good seer. She'll see something happening. I'm oblivious sometimes, you know. I guess I'm focused on something else, but she said she sees something happening. She'll sit me down and say, this is what I see. This is where we're being challenged at. And it's up to me as the man of the house to say, I hear where you're coming from. Even if I don't see it, I trust the Christ in her because she's been gifted in the area that I'm not gifted in. So then I go before God and I say, Lord, this is what Kelly's seeing. Can I get a scripture? Show me a scripture. You know, whether I'm reading in the word, the rhema word, the logos word, whatever way God gives me through somebody else, um, that word comes and I'm led to a scripture. I get that scripture, I pray over that scripture, and then what I do is I take this, and if I don't have my boys together, they'll tell you, I blow their phones up. <laughs> they have scriptures and passages, and I can only imagine what their face looks like when they, this has been going on all their life, it's nothing new. But, um, and I give it to them. They have the word of God, and that's called our family scripture. And yes, me and my wife test, test them on it every now and then. All right, let's say the scripture together. And we listen to who's chiming in and who's trying to be a second after the other person so that they can hear what's being said. We listen. But it's our responsibility to make sure that they're equipped for the battle that we are in. Okay? And we can't make sure they're equipped for that battle if we're not equipped. So if I'm teaching them something that I'm not doing, then am I truly teaching them something that's going to be benefit them? No, I'm not. So let's talk about the weapon as a de offensive weapon. The Word of God is also the sword um, used offensively. This is a weapon that you can use to inflict real damage on the work and the kingdom of Satan. I have two ways I would like to talk about you of how we can use the word of God, the sword of the spirit, as an offensive weapon to put a stop or even slow down the advancement of the kingdom of, of Satan's kingdom. The first area is to expose the deeds of darkness. Expose the deeds of darkness. Darkness covers dirt. Darkness covers lies. Darkness covers dishonesty. Darkness covers all of those things that I want to hide and I don't want revealed to anyone. Darkness covers those areas. And in those situations... I don't want to turn on the light because if I turn on the light, you can see my nakedness. You can see 
my lies. You can see my dirt, my filth. So as humans, we choose to keep that light turned off. Why? We turned off and, and, and operate in the dark, preferably. Why? Because we stay comfortable. We're not comfortable being exposed. But if you know the game plan of the enemy, if I'm in darkness, he has me. He has me. And when I've learned personally to just be open, my, my, my sin that I was the best at, and I'm not going to lie to you, my wife will tell you I was good. I was one of the best liars you would ever meet. You could not, you would not know I'm lying. I could tell a lie and it meant nothing to me. And I would lie for no reason. It's like sometimes I would say to myself, why'd you do that? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how entrapped I was in that sin. And that's the sin that the enemy attacked me with. And I found out later he tagged me with the sin of lying because it also opened up the sin of vanity. I was full of vanity. My life was all about the glitz and the glam, the gold, the Rolex, the Audis, the cars. That was my life. And that's how Satan chose to attack me. And I started praying and warring after that because that's not who I desire to be. That's not the man that I wanted to be for this lady. That's not the man I wanted, the father I wanted to be for those boys. I started praying against that. And it's so awesome how Satan, how, how God turns things around in our favor. When I started praying, praying for God to renew me, help me, I don't like this. You know what? You can ask them now. And, I, and I'm not going to tell you everything, but I can't even lie to them now. You know why? Something goes on physically in my body when I tell a lie and my wife or children, you know what they say? If I say something and they question it, like I'm standing this way, you know what my wife say? All right, now turn around and look at me and say what you just said and answer my question. So she, I'll turn around and face her, then she'll ask me the question because I can't, I don't know what it is. They told me. And I try to correct it, but it feels so awkward. So I know they know I'm lying. But God caused me to walk away from that and to not do it. Why? Because now I have accountability. I'm held accountable, not only to them, but to myself through the way. So when I'm talking to somebody else, I'm like, well, they probably pick up on the same thing they do. So why am I lie to them? I'm a grown man. I don't need to lie anymore. So we have to speak the words of God. Now, how we must proclaim the word of God, should I say, um, and uncover those things. The second area is to preach the gospel of salvation. Talk to others about the godliness of Christ and his desire for mankind to accept him as the Lord of their lives. That's sharing the gospel with other people. It's very simple. This is the greatest way that we can cause damage to the kingdom of Satan. And that is to turn a people, turn people away from Satan and point them in the direction of Christ Jesus. Woo! That's strong right there. I don't know if you ever did it, but that feels so, so, oh, so good to see somebody turn from the world, to turn from Satan, to turn from the works of the enemy. And even if they don't know much about Christ, even if they, I'm not totally for sure this, but you know what? I'm going to give myself to Christ because I want to give him an opportunity to show me. I can always go back to being nothing, to, to live in that life. I can always go back to that. But I want to try this good life you're talking about. That feels so good to see somebody turn and walk in that direction. It brings chills on, in, in me thinking about it. It's imperative for us to know the scripture and to know how to use the scripture. It's imperative for us to know the sword and know how to use the sword. What good is this if I know it exists? I know it's there, but I haven't been trained on how to use it. What good is it? If I have a gun, but I don't know how to use it, what good is it? Oh, that's not a good example. You just point and shoot. Well, what if the safety's on? <laughs> what you going to shoot? You know, what good is just knowing it? You can't just know it. 
and not use it. I mean, you can if that's the life you choose to live, but God wants better for us. God wants better. Does that mean this, that you won't get into heaven and, and you don't have a relationship with Christ? No, We're, that's something else. That's another topic. We're not talking to that about that. But what it means is life becomes more easy for us living here on earth and battling against the one who wants to take the purpose of Christ from within us. That's where it becomes easier. That's where we, be, we got to be, become passionate about this thing that uh, uh, advanced in the kingdom of God. Now you might say, all right, you talked about that. Now I want to explain to you quickly how. If you want to become skilled in the use of the sword as the Lord Jesus wants, there are five things you must do. First of all, you got to read the Bible. Not only read the Bible, but also you got to study it. In 2 Timothy 2 and 15, it says, work hard so God can say to you, well done. Be a good workman, one who does not need to be ashamed when God examines your work. Know what his word says and means. You can listen to sermons all day. You can read pamphlets. You can read tracts. You can read booklets. But I guarantee you, it, it'll be good. It's, it's not that it won't be good for you, but it won't be half as good for you as picking up the Bible and reading and studying it yourself. Picking up the word and relying on yourself. Why? Well, let's think about it. Only by reading the scripture ourselves do we learn what fully is in the word of God. Don't allow your knowledge to become narrow, but rather whole, the, become and embrace the whole counsel of God. Only by reading and studying the Bible ourselves do we learn how to use our Bible or sword. That's how you learn to be better at your craft, better at your skill. And lastly, maybe the most important thing, when you personally read and study the scriptures, you are given the spirit of God, the opportunity to move within you and to work within you like you've never seen before. And then finally, pray for divine enlightenment and understanding. David did this often. Before you read your Bible, it's simple. Just ask the Lord to reveal to you what he has for you in the word, okay? Before you read the Bible, Lord, show me what your will is. Show me how this applies to my life. That's basically what that means. And when you ask for that, he will show you. I'm not saying he's going to show you in that one instance and it's going to be kaboom. No, but as you read it and as you go through your day, I've had points where I say, wow, Okay, this is, what the, this is what you was talking about this morning in my wife and I's devotion. Or I'll, somebody will say something to me, and I'm like, wow, okay, it's revealed. But you have to start the process. Don't go in with nothing, but you have to start the progress, process. And then find, the um, third thing is to memorize the scripture. Um, Memorize the scripture because remembering what you read one day will provide stepping stones to understand another passage tomorrow. And what you do is simple. You can take the word or different scriptures you get, write it on a three um, by five note card. That's what I did to help me reading scripture and even to get through grad school. I write it down and then I'll study it three times a day. Study it. Go back to it at least three times a day. Read it. And then it became a part of me. After I mastered about 12 of those cards or 10 of those cards, I'll take it and I'll put it aside. And I would only review them once a day or maybe twice, but once a day. And then I'll do another set of cards. Um, if this is something you truly want to pursue, then I encourage you to do it that way. Um, God will provide. In Romans 12 and 2, it says... Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And then the fourth thing of the five is to meditate on the word. Connected to memorizing is meditating. Meditating on the word of God, it means deeply thinking about something. 
I mean, you might ask what meditating is. Meditating means to think deeply about something. It is to reflect on something. It's to roll something over in your mind throughout the day. That's meditating on something. And that's what God says. Once you memorize it, begin to meditate on it. Why should I meditate on it? Because it's then ingrained in your heart when you begin to meditate on it. So it's no longer just stored here. It's stored here. And what happens when you take it from here, that allows it to come accurately out of here and you bring it down here this allows your actions to be in line with what you're saying here the reason you find some people who actions don't align with what they say because it's not in their heart once it's in your heart as a man thinketh in his heart so is he so once it's in your heart that begins to Elude your your actions, show your actions of what's lying there. And then finally, this last area is to share the word with others. We need to share the blessings of God to other people. And when we share God's word to other people, many things happen. But two, I want to bring out that I pointed out that God showed me and revealed to me in, in, in studying this is that we begin to bless others through helping them Point, be pointed towards Christ. So that's a blessing when we help others be pointed towards Christ. Do you know how much of a blessing that you have been in their life? All you got to do is point them towards Jesus. Man, that is a blessing. The second way is we are blessed because in our sharing, we grow in our memory and we grow in our knowledge. And that is also a blessing for us. If God has shown you truth, tell it. If God has shown you love, give it. Give those things God has given you. You know, give it back to others. And as you do that, it begins to grow in you. I want to ask our praise team to come on up as we talk about this last area and ask you to stand. This last area is called commitment. If you don't commit to anything else you heard today, I encourage you to commit to Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you heard nothing else, I pray that you hear this in Jesus' name, that all things and that the enemy chooses to block your hearing with be cast down in the name of Jesus and your heart be open to receive the word of God. Here, commit your life to the Lord Jesus and all else will fall in place. I promise you. So, if you never committed your life to Christ Jesus, I want to give you this time right now to do that. To say, Lord, I want to give you a chance. I I want you to take over my life and show me, teach me. I don't fully understand what he's talking about today, but help me. Help me in in, in my lack of understanding. Help me. And if you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior Jesus one time in your life, and you kind of walked away from that, we want to take this time to say, okay, Lord, I realize I'm far away from you, and I want to be restored right back in place. And see, that's where I fall in every day. I'm not ashamed to admit that every day I'm asking, I won't say every day, but just about every day, I'm before God saying, Lord, restore me. I, it's not that I've lost my salvation, it's that I've lost my connection. I've gone astray from the heart of God, and I want him to restore me and bring me closer back to him because then I'm in alignment with what he has in store for me. So let's pray. Close your eyes and let's pray together. And if either one of those be you and you want more of the Lord, let's ask him. Repeat after me, Father God, I thank you for this opportunity to hear your word in a way that I can use it to better myself but ultimately advance your kingdom. I know this cannot happen without you, number one in my life. So come in, live and use me for your glory. Teach me, help me grow. In Jesus' name, amen. 
I pray in Jesus' name that you go out today and you choose to fight with this. You have a choice to choose to fight with this, but leave it at home. Once you start fighting with this, I promise you, you will never go back to plastic swords again. Bless you. Wow. Good message today. Now we're equipped even more. Amen. So we'll take this sword of the spirit. Well, Christine won't let us have this one. <laughs> um, but we'll take this message into this week with new strength and new power. Amen. So God bless you all. Thank you for coming and come on back and see us next week. Thanks. Thanks.